Thank you, Grayson, Sarah. Thank you, Clay, Tom, and Colin. Colin, if you haven't figured out yet, is the engaged guy uh, that's up there. He was like beaming when you saw him out there. Um, glad he, walked, he brushed his teeth today. That's a good thing. So Colin got engaged in Savannah, uh, said yes. I think he had spent a couple hours persuading her to do that. She said yes, he's right there, so good for that. All right, well, it's good to be back with you uh, this week. Last week, I was uh, down in West Virginia, and uh, Vinny, who's in my, Vinny Moore, who's in my small group, uh, he had been praying for me, so he came up to me today and asked me how things went in West Virginia last weekend. And I told Vinny, I'm so thankful that you were thinking about what happened. And I told him about the story. I have two, uh, actually two young men who attended here at EBC while they were at Cedarville. Uh, now they're pastors in Winfield, West Virginia, Andrew Gordon and Mark Toole, and they have uh, five children between them. Uh, and so I got to go down and, and be with their church yesterday uh, and recognize that churches all over are, are struggling with the impacts of COVID and all the other things. And by God's grace, they're, they're doing well and moving forward. So thankful for that. And they send their love. And, and uh, we had a special thing. Their pastor is also a, a chaplain. Uh, in the army, and he is now in Kuwait on a year uh, appointment there as the chaplain. So Andrew and Mark are pastoring over this year, and he beamed in via a video uh, to um, uh, give the morning prayer and announcements uh, in his fatigues, uh, and also to pray for Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, for the ministry that happened last week. And I heard really good things about uh, the service last week, and so thanks to uh, Grayson and Steve for putting that together. Uh, why I called an audible last week. Well, would you take your Bibles and open to 2 Timothy chapter 1? And uh, hopefully, uh, one of the things I want to encourage you, I sound awful loud, but I don't know if that's me. Uh, I sound okay. Well, Matt's giving me the shrug that no, you're not. Um, so uh, I hope uh, uh, we're going to be in 2 Timothy over the next uh, couple months or more. And uh, one of the things I would really encourage you to do is to get in the habit of when we're in a particular book or we're studying somewhere, that you just get in the habit of just reading and rereading that text over and over again. Uh, and one of the things that this is only four chapters, and one of the problems we often had when we read our Bibles is we get, unfortunately, we get bored very quickly with them uh, because we look for some marquee passage or something that jumps out to us. Uh, and really, the, the evil one does not want us to set over a text over a period of time and just sit there and figure it out and then wrestle till we say, well, then if I get this and this is true, then how should it change the way I think and how should it change the way I live? And so I, I want to encourage you to be a person who has the kind of patience that the evil one does not want you to have. Right? He wants you to be satisfied with somebody sending you a verse every day, and that's great. I'm glad that people do that. I'm glad that there's opportunities for that to happen. But there's just no, there's no uh, substitute for you doing your own reading. And matter of fact, there's no substitute for you learning how to read your own Bibles in ways that enrich and deepen it for your own sake and for the sake of your family and the people that God brings you into contact with. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, as can many people, is that when God teaches you something, he almost always gives you somebody to reteach it to. And in almost one of those moments like, I think I had my devotions for you this morning, right? Uh, those kinds of moments because I'll have somebody come to me and just what I was reading about, just what I was thinking about, all of a sudden that becomes so important for the conversation, even as, if it's just to orient me right in the conversation when we're there. Now, Second Timothy... Uh, the series here is we're looking in on a mentor's advice to his protege, Timothy, and he's trying to encourage him and guide him to a life that's unstoppable. And it's not just a life that it hangs on, right? So you've seen the picture, which is so common, right, of the little kitten hanging on to the limb by its little claws, right? Uh, barely able to hang in there, but at least they're hanging in there, if you will. But the issue here is, is he wants Timothy to live a life of love and purpose and service right in the midst of a crisis, right? 
And so this is one of the things that we've all been struggling with where we've lived in this COVID crisis, where we've lived in, uh, 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 if we believe certain people, you know, that the earth is just about 10 years away from being burnt to a crisp, right? And all of us with it, right? This is the third burning of the earth in the last 20 years, right? But, you know, we're, we're right there on the cusp. And just, I was listening to a little podcast the other day where a mother, a mother was asking someone to give her some advice on how to help her child deal with the weight of the fact that the earth is going to be destroyed in 12 years. Well, if you're a nine-year-old child, that's a really big burden to bear, right? And so we live in a moment there where, and, and one, of the, one of the postures, right, when you get into a time of trouble, some people just get in a fetal position. Some people, it becomes safety first, right? I got to protect myself first. It becomes the idea. Well, here, the same answer uh, for the good times of life is the same answer for the bad times of life. And the answer is it's Christ first. It's Christ first. He's the only safe place to run. He's the only one that can tell you the right path to follow. He's the one that can keep you from freaking out and heading in the wrong direction, right? He can keep you from giving up, from giving in, from giving out, right? All those kind of things like that. Christ is the only safe place to run in those kinds of moments. And so here, they're in the midst of a dire personal crisis. Timothy is seeing his mentor uh, soon going to be executed. Paul is facing his own execution. And, and of course, the, one of the ironies of the whole book is that Paul is in, in, in many ways in the darkest place. Paul is there and he's facing his upcoming death. He's in a, a terrible place. Uh, he's on death row. Uh, and he's also watching the center of his life's ministries implode in Ephesus. And he says in chapter 1, all of Asia has left me. And so what we want to look at here, and we put this down in a couple ways, we're asking God to deepen our faith in Christ, to strengthen our resolve to follow him, to guide us onto and in the path of truth and life, and to keep our steps from faltering along the way, right? Right? So this is what Paul is wanting to do for Timothy. And he wants to say, right, this is Paul, is he's trying to encourage Timothy to live this kind of life because he wants Timothy to say the same thing that Paul is saying at the end of his life, right, of, of something that he aspires to. And it says here, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So Paul is coming to the end of his life, and as he comes to the end of his life, he comes there with at least one uh, no regret, and that is the fact that by God's grace, he never abandoned Jesus and his mission. And so all those things here, I don't know, right, for the course of our life, the, the term that he talks about race there uh, is often an idea that, that we all have our own race. We're not competing against each other. I have a unique course that God's going to take me on. This is one of the, the mysteries of the Christian life. If you've been around the Christian faith for any length of time, you've observed that, that you can find faithful followers of Christ who have very different experiences in their following of Jesus. There are some people that are faithful to Christ, and it seems like health-wise and relationship-wise, things seem to go great. Then you've got somebody over here, and they're following Jesus, and they die of cancer at a young age, or they wrestle with a disability that puts them in a wheelchair, or they have a, a tragic thing that happens to them, or God takes them to a place where they live in danger as they serve Jesus. Right? So the idea here is that our courses are different, but the point is, will we run our own individual life in a way where we're faithful to Jesus today, tomorrow, the next day? You know, this, uh, I've mentioned this, I've had a couple times to mention this this week, and I don't know why it's come up, but uh, I had a chance to go to Israel. This is about 10 years ago now when I reflected on it. It was my early 50s. Uh, I went there, and... I was in Israel, and one of the things that really, really impacted me, and I know I've mentioned it here before, but I was taken up to the place as a part of our tour to the traditional site where Moses looked over into the Holy Land. 
And you know the story, right? Moses had seen God do amazing things. He had been used by God to lead the children out of children of Israel out of Egypt, and he'd seen the power of God in just absolutely uh, unbelievable ways demonstrated from the get-go, right? All of the plagues, the, the delivery through the sea, the provision in the wilderness, all those things like that. And then Moses, right? This great man of God, this man who had seen everything that God could do, who had experienced God in a very unique way as he was taken up onto the mountain and God revealed the Ten Commandments to him and gave him the covenant. Here was Moses toward the end of his life who in a fit of rage and pride stood back from God's call in his life and fell down just before the finish line. Just he fell down. Then I got thinking about the Old Testament and that was true of David. That was true of Solomon. And I said, God, I don't want to fall down at the finish line. And so if, you're, if you've walked with Christ for years, right, the evil one is after you. If you've just started, the evil one is after you. Right? And so how do we live a life where we hold fast to and we come to the end of our life and we can say with Paul, right, I've run the race. I've run the race by God's grace. I've run the race. And one of the things I don't want to leave, as many of you as well, as I get older, right, as grandchildren come into the picture, uh, I do not want my daughters, my wife, my grandchildren, the students that I have taught, the people that God has given me as a pastor to, to pastor over the years. I don't want them to have to draw deeply on the grace of God to somehow hold on to Jesus despite the fact of my failure. I don't want to make it hard for people to hold on to Jesus because the guy that they thought was leading them to Jesus bailed. So God help us. May we pray for one another. And this is what Paul is saying to Peter. I mean, Paul is saying to Peter. Paul is saying to Timothy uh, here about what's going on. So he's trying to encourage Timothy to stay in the truth of God's big story, right? And this is what's going to be at the center of this. And uh, Van was talking about it in his prayer. The big story. What is really true today? What is really going on? Who's in control of everything, right? Uh, thank God that our people in the government are not in control of everything. That's all I can say, right? But who isn't really in control of everything? Is the world spinning out of control? What really matters today? What's the important things to do? At the end of the day, who's the person that I don't want to disappoint? Who's that person? Who at the end of the day do I know that, that if I please him, I've done everything that I could do today for the people in my life? And so this is what Paul is trying to do. He wants to take him to the big store because what's happening in Ephesus is another group of false teachers, and this is what makes it even more difficult. They have uh, uh, rose up from within the church, and now they're telling a different story about how God saves. And they're messing with the story as if they could rewrite the script and because they're changing the script about how God saves, it's messing up people's lives. And Paul uh, speaks about their, their, their uh, teaching as if it was a, a, a creeping gangrene, an infection that is killing off the faith of people. Right? I want to draw your attention. This is what he says. Look at chapter 2. If you're in chapter 1, look at chapter 2, verse 16 with me for a moment. This is where he talks about uh, the people that he's dealing with here. Avoid godless chatter. This is uh, Paul's word for any supposed theology that is not really based in what God has revealed about himself and the word, right? There's a lot of godless chatter, right? Meaning it, it may have the word Jesus on it. It may talk about salvation. It may talk about faith. It may talk about all kinds of things, but it's truly godless because it's disconnected from what God has revealed about himself. But it sounds, it has kind of a, a, a surface appeal to it, Right? And we see that all the time in our own culture. Right? We, uh, you go through a political season, you will find right, cynical politicians, some of them genuinely uh, 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 followers of Christ, but you will often find them sprinkling little, little bits of religious terminology and phraseology around their, their uh, uh, um, uh, desire to get, uh, uh, I can't even speak today, desire to get elected, uh, their campaigns, and they get sprinkled around, and it, and, it, and it confuses and sometimes deceives people of faith to think that, well, oh, they're really interested in the things of God. They're really interested in God's purposes and moving forward. And that sounds pretty good. But the devil is often in the details in terms of what exactly they're using that for and what it happens to support. 
And so here's a group of men. He says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Okay? Now, uh, you've seen this chart before when we were in the book of Corinthians way back when. But I just wonder, what, what really are they saying here and what's happening in this type of thing? It's a strange thing to think about that the resurrection has already come, right? Well, in Paul's teaching in the scriptures, right, Christ has resurrected, right? And because he's resurrected, it's promised our own future resurrection. And when we believe on Jesus Christ, when we recognize that we're a sinner and we believe on him, then the resurrection life of Christ becomes ours because we're united with him. So we're brought to newness of life. Right? But that's a, a resurrection that inaugurates something, that begins a process that won't be consummated until we see Jesus. Right? So Paul talks about we are already resurrected, but not yet, right? is the idea, because we've entered into this newness of life, but we won't experience the fullness of it and the impact of it until we see Christ. That's why Paul will say in a passage like Philippians chapter 3, right? he'll say, we're waiting for our Savior to come from heaven. Right? Our Savior who's going to change the bodies of our humiliation into the likeness of His glorious body. We're waiting for that, right? So, and for the Christian, the bulk of the expectation is in the future, right? The best is, is by far yet to come. Well, now we've got a group of, of believers who are trying to say, right, in the name of Christ, that we don't live in this time in between the times of Christ's first and second coming. We don't live in this time where there's the overlap of the ages, right, where God's rule has broken in, but we still live in a world that's fallen. We still live in a world with sinful impulse. We still live where the evil one is at work. We still struggle within our own lives as Christians against the darkness in our own souls, Well, they're saying, no, 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 we're beyond that in-between time, and we're here in the resurrection. We're already arrived. We've already experienced everything that God has promised us. And this promotes arrogance. It promotes naivete about their own sin. And so it's disordered the whole understanding of how God is saved. Underneath all of that is the audacity of some group of men to impose their own structure of the way things are over top of God's and to say, here, let me tell you how God saves. And again, it's confusing for the people who are listening because they're using the words Jesus and God and they're using religious language and they're using, even they're talking about resurrection. Well, resurrection is a biblical concept, right? So it sounds very orthodox and it's confusing people. And the impacts of it as they're trying to work out this new understanding of God's salvation is the scripture does not tell us how to live as fully resurrected people. And there's one simple reason why we're not. Right? It doesn't tell us, right? When you read the Lord's Prayer and Jesus tells us how to pray as his followers, right there in his prayer is a prayer that, that we would be delivered from the evil one that we would be taken deeply into grace so that we could forgive those who've been forgiven, that we're utterly dependent upon him, that his kingdom is yet to come. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come. We're waiting for it to come. Jesus built in, we live in a sense of anticipation. These people are saying, no, no, you don't need to anticipate anymore. Here we are, right here. So they're rewriting these things and instead of living in this moment where we're conscious of the fact that I have resources today to follow God so that I don't need to get in a fetal position when I get up out of bed and say it's too scary out there, I could really screw up today. No, on the other hand, I have caution because I can screw up today, right? I was sitting back there in the green room this morning speaking to uh, the team as we were getting together and and I, I did not have a stellar morning this morning, right? So the dryer vent came off of the dryer Right? Just a huge tragedy, right? The dryer vent coming off the dryer, starting to spew the, the hot air and the moist hot air into the house. I'm in the middle of trying to do something to get prepared this morning. Rana gives the, the call of alarm uh, for me to come fix it. And so I get in there and I'm irritated by it. Then the table that's back there in relationship to it is broken. And it's not functioning right. And so I just responded in a very godly way, right? Just was like, rah, 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 round the thing. And Ron and I chipped at each other and that kind of stuff like that. And it was just, just a sweet, sweet marital moment, right? This morning. 
And, and you, re- you recognize, good grief, and did I prepare for that today? Did I, did I, was I even cognizant, right? All of us as followers of Jesus, if, if Satan walked into our life with a big S tattooed on his forehead all the time, we got, oh, mm, you ain't coming in here. Mm-mm. I see that, but he doesn't do that. He shows up in a little moment where something goes wrong and where you just don't get your way that you want to, or your plans don't work out, or you get up on the wrong side of the bed. Some of you, you need to change your whole bed around because you get up on the wrong side every day, right? Whatever it is, right? Those kind of things like that, that's the moment where you can set off a relationship, you can set off a day, you can do damage to people in those kinds of moments. And if you're not aware of that, you're just naive. You're just naive, right? And so he's, they're telling them, well, you don't have to worry about these things because you're here. But some of the key things that's coming about them, and we'll get to these later, is it's distorted their vision of everyday life. And they've, they're making up rules because Scripture doesn't tell us how to live as resurrected people, so they start to make up their rules. It's something about, you know, charlatans, just because they don't know what they're doing doesn't mean that they can't be confident in their incompetence, Right? And so they start making up rules for how we ought to live, and they're telling people that, you know, if you're really a resurrected person, you should only eat certain foods. You'll find that back in 1 Timothy chapter 4. There's some sort of menu that if you're really a resurrected person, you should only eat certain things. And then they're they're stepping into the relationships between men and women, and there's an obsession about sex that's involved in here that's darkening things. They're forbidding people to marry. Right? We've talked about that. It's, that would be quite an interesting thing. I often joke about that at Cedarville. They have a ministry called Fit to be Tied, where we help students to work toward marriage. And I said, we just eliminate the whole budget for Fit to be Tied and take up the teaching of the heretics in 1 Timothy 4. Right? Somebody walks into my office, right? Colin and Savannah walk in and say, hey, Dr. Kazer, we're thinking about getting married. And I said, we only need one session. Let's just come talk. And they walk in and I said, I got a real quick answer. No. No. No, it ain't happening. Okay, so figure something else out. Okay, thanks. Good to see you today. Right? There's nothing that happen. Right? Well, this is what, and you can imagine what's happening here then is that it's distorting male-female relationships. You have young widows, we'll read about this in 1 Timothy 5, that are being denied God's uh, rightly ordained provision in marriage for procreation, for sexual intimacy, for communion and, and connection that if the person is so gifted. They're denying that. And you've got young widows who are abandoning the faith under the strain. Some of them are entered, in, uh, entering illicit relationships because of it. You've got men seeding the, the rightful places that they should be taking. The qualified men in leading in the church are seeding those positions to women. Things are happening that are going on that are upturning the whole household. And then if you're a married person, it gets pretty awkward. Well, now I'm a married person, and now it's taught by my church that, that we forbid people to get married. Well, what do I do now? What do I do now? That's really kind of awkward. So now, not only is the church all messed up with a bunch of silly rules that have nothing to do with what it really means to live out their Christian life, and they're being robbed of the life that they have, they're confused, and the church has lost its identity and lost its mission because they're all caught up in things that don't matter. Right? And this is, this is a provocative one. We'll come back to this in many different ways because this is a provocative issue for us now. We have all kinds of people trying to tell us what the church should be talking about all the time. All kinds of people telling us what we should be putting out on our um, uh, identifying with and validating and so forth and so on. And here, he's going to tell Timothy, the only way you're going to hold fast to genuine life, to a life of purpose, love, service, blessing, is if you hold fast to the truth. That needs to help you navigate. As a matter of fact, that famous passage, Timothy, you need to be a, a, a pastor who rightly divides the Word of God. One of the ways to think about that passage, he says, you need to be a person who can take the truth and cut a straight path through all the flack and lies that you're going to confront. Okay? And we need the Scriptures to do that for us. And so as we come here, we're opening the, the opening charge that Paul gives to Timothy uh, to help him hold fast. That's really what he wants to do. And and the whole first chapter is setting up for the whole book, right? And so his initial charge, and this is where he begins. So if you have your notes, right, this is, I think, on the back of the the program. Uh, You can fill in your blanks here along the way. But but more than that, I hope that you'll write down whatever God uh, has to say to you today. So as he gets started, uh, before he's going to work through some of the details, Paul writes to his beloved son in faith to prepare him for what he faces and to provide resources for him to stay the course. 
In the first chapter, he spells out the elements necessary to hold fast to the path of love, purpose, and service of genuine life in this time of real crisis. Okay? So he's going to give him uh, the elements that are necessary. Now, the starting point uh, is the sincere faith. And I want you to look at, ch- at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's just read this opening two verses here, or verses 3 through 5. I'm sorry, three verses. Here's where he begins with thanksgiving. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now, just as an aside, before I comment about this thing here, um, notice how, how, how intimate the relationship is with, between Paul and Timothy, right? If you just think about the people in your life, of how many people in your life, especially in your friend groups, that you know the names of their mother and their grandmother, right? So Paul is, and, and Timothy's lives are deeply intertwined. When we get to chapter 3 and verse 10, we'll find out how deeply intertwined they are because they were 24-7 together in the trenches serving Christ together. And so there was no pretensions between Paul and Timothy. Um, Paul didn't have a relationship with Timothy where he got himself cleaned up, presented his best spiritual face, right, and, and met with Timothy once a week in a nice coffee shop, as good as all those meetings are, right? I just encourage all those. But Paul and Timothy had lived side by side 24-7. You just know who the person is, and they can't make any pretenses. So his whole life is really uh, the, the foundation. Paul's whole life is the foundation of his appeal to Timothy at this moment. And I say this to you as parents, right? Um, I say this, somebody t- told me when I was, uh, uh, had little girls before they were teenagers and uh, told me to, that I needed to really love them well over those young years so that when they got to the point where uh, I needed them to invite me in, I would have a platform that would make them want to invite me in. Because, you know, if you, if you got teenagers, you, you, can't, you can put yourself in their lives. If you have to insert your life because you're worried about them or they're in danger, you will stick your life in there. But you know that if you have to do that and you're not being invited, you know that you're already in trouble. So you want to be invited, right? And one of the things that you want to do is that every day with your kids, every day with your wife, every day with your friends and colleagues, you are building some sort of platform that you can either stand on or will crumble under you when the difficult times come. And if you're building a platform of constant care and prayer and interest in them over a period of time, when you're, you're worried or they're in trouble or they're looking for help, um, that will be the platform that will turn them to open their ears and hearts to who you are and what you want to tell them about Jesus, right? So this is Paul doing it here. So this faith, the ability to hold fast to the truth. Remember our song? The ability to hold fast to the truth, the real life is all because we are being held fast by Christ, okay? Because this is, you understand, as Christians, understand what faith is and what faith isn't, right? Sincere faith. He's looking to see this is the beginning point because all of his other advice, if Timothy isn't someone who himself has put trust in these truths, it doesn't make sense for Paul to lean into, for tell Timothy to lean into them. This is all, he's recounting, right, Timothy's, the parting that he had with Timothy and the life that Timothy had lived, and he knows that Timothy himself has put his faith in the truths that he's going to encourage him to recall, right? But faith really is the act of abandoning trust in ourselves and anything else, right? A sincere faith is abandoning ourselves and anything or anyone else and casting ourselves on Christ, right? And Paul says here, this puts us in a long train of people who've done that, right? So Timothy is in the long train of of his mom and his grandmother, of Eunice and Lois, and also of his spiritual father, Paul, even as Paul is in a long train of faithful Jews who have believed in Jesus over the years, right? So we stand, all of us who stand, we stand in a long train of people who've walked this path before us. 
And Timothy, I'm so encouraged that you're in that same path, Timothy, that you have put your trust in Christ. And it's not our faith that secures us. It's because our object is powerful and faithful that we're secure. Right? Remember the little thing that we sang in our song, sometimes our faith is cold. Sometimes we're praying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But thank God that the object of our faith is faithful. He will hold you fast, right? Thank God, he will hold you fast, right? So Timothy has, and the marks of Timothy's sincere faith, right, the tears, right? If you have a sincere faith, and I just wrote this to myself, the sincerity of Timothy's faith is there in his love for Paul, for his fellow believer, and in his loyalty to God's mission, right? So he's confident because Timothy, really, if you're thinking about Timothy, he says later on that all of Asia has left me. Really, Timothy is like the last of the Mohicans, right? I mean, Timothy is, is the last of, those, uh, of the small few, the band of brothers, if you will, that are still faithful to the gospel. He's one of the last ones. And so there's Timothy standing fast as a young man being pummeled by people who are older in, in life and older in ministry than him who've abandoned the truth. They have, pop, they have popularity and followers after them. And Timothy is standing there on behalf of Paul and on behalf of his own convictions. And he's saying, I love you. You need to turn. These people are charlatans. God, help us to turn back to the truth. So Timothy, right, has a sincere faith, and that's the foundation of everything. Everything that I'm going to tell you today, if you're here, you're listening online, right, wherever you are, all this advice really doesn't matter if you don't know Jesus. You don't know Jesus. It has to begin with him laying hold of you when you abandon yourself and call out to him and say, God, do for me what I don't deserve, what I can't do for myself. God, rescue me from my sin. God, lay hold of me, please. And Jesus says, I will. I will, right? Now, all that is based on that. That's the starting point. So if you're not there today, I beg you in the name of Christ to take the claims of Jesus serious, right? There's a lot of other stories out there. We'll talk about them over time. The story here is of a God who created a world and a humanity who rebelled, and a God who at his own cost intervened to reclaim and restore. And he's done that in Christ, and he's proved his faithfulness over the years. He's rescued many. You can't explain their salvation by their upbringing or their cultural heritage or their location on the globe. You can only explain it by the in involvement of a God to rescue people who are undeserving over the ages. And God is working, and he's going to bring it all to a conclusion. And one day, all of humanity will be swept up before the God who has created it for him to judge the living and the dead. That's the story, right, that Timothy has believed, right? Now, before we get here, right, I want to I talk to you about something. This is uh, uh, my Bible study side of me. Uh, that's a little bit of part of here. Before we go through the, 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 the guts of what he's going to say, I just wanted to point out to you, this is not just showing you something that doesn't matter. I hope you'll get it as we walk our way through, that Paul really uh, sets up, he uses a kind of a literary approach as he gives Timothy his charge, and it's called a chiasm, is what it's called. It's just all it means is just like an X-like structure, but it's a very common thing that was done in the first century, right? This letter was often read and heard as opposed to uh, at times examined by many people. And so Paul would write in ways to make uh, his, his material memorable uh, and meaningful, both of them. And what he does, what a chiasm is, if you can see it's A, B, C, and then there's the center and then C, B, A. All what it is is the, the center point, the pivot, the core of the whole charge is right in the center, right? X marks the spot. It's right in the center. But all the things that are related to that truth, he walks in with the same three and then walks backwards out with the same three. And so the core is the gospel. And then he's going to say, we need to draw on God's enabling spirit to live out that gospel. And then we need to do it in a way with unashamed love. And then we need to expect suffering. Okay? And the first three, A, B, C, or him calling Timothy to do that on the CBA on the way out is Paul saying, I've done all those, right? 
So if you see them, that's why I've tried to color those words. The spirit and the spirit hold together the beginning and the end, then ashamed and ashamed, and then suffering, and then the gospel right at the center. Okay? So this is why it's going to explain the way when I, give, I do my points, I'm going to gather together verses 6 and 7 and verses 13 and 14, verse 8 and verse uh, uh, nine, 12 here and so forth and so on. So Paul is trying to double up on the charge and make it uh, memorable and meaningful. Okay? So a couple things here. So you'll see it. I won't come back here, I promise. I won't, I won't stay here on that. Okay, so the first thing, right? So here's the core, the pivot right at the core of his charge is the gospel, okay? Here's, here's the true path. You've got to hold on to sound doctrine, okay? And the gospel here is the story, right? This is the important thing. The gospel is the account. It's God's account of what he has done, what he will do, what he is doing in Christ through the Spirit to restore and reclaim everything, right? So it's God's story, of what he has done, is doing, will do in Christ, in the work of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit to restore and reclaim everything, right? It's everything. It has its roots before time, and it will be completed right at the end of time and extend beyond it, right? So this is the gospel, the good news. It's the story that's the core truth that makes sense of and drives all of the other ones, because if this is true, then you'll suffer for it. If this is true, then you'll, you'll declare it unashamedly and you'll live it out unashamedly. If this is true, right, you're going to draw and you need supernatural power, the Spirit of God to sustain you to follow it, right? So these are the things that we're going to find. So the first is the true path. If you're going to hold fast, right, first it, it begins with sincere faith. The second thing, you've got to get the truth right, right? You've got to know which path you're on. So you got to get that clear, right? There's a lot of people that are trying to tell you about different paths to find significance and find life, right? Well, where is the path to get on and stay on to find life? So here's what he says right in the middle. Who has saved us by the power of God, who has saved us, God, and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Okay? Now, I'm only going to give you just a few statements, and you won't be able to write these down, but I just want to suggest to you what's embedded in this little account. This is one of the most concise little accounts that Paul gives of what he calls the gospel. You will hear many people say, well, the gospel, that's over in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul does that. Well, he does it there too, but Paul often recounts the gospel uh, in a way that's relevant to what he's trying to deal with in a given book. He very seldom ever gives it all, okay? So here's an account that he gives that's relevant, especially to Timothy. Here's some of the things that we know of some truths that should guide us if we believe the gospel to be the true account of the way things are. Okay, one, God is the one in charge of salvation. Salvation unfolds according to his eternal plan, right? That's an important thing here. God is the one who's in charge of salvation. It unfolds according to his eternal plan. Second thing, human beings are under the control of death. And as we understand within Paul, that's physical and spiritual death, and they cannot save themselves. So God's in charge, and it's going according to his purposes, and human beings cannot save themselves, and they're in the worst way possible. They're underneath the sentence of death, and they they cannot regain the life that they've lost. Three, God acted on his own initiative according to his own eternal purposes. He came after the undeserving and those who could not save themselves, right? God doesn't help those who help themselves. He helps those who can't help themselves, right? He doesn't help anybody who's looking for him to come for him. He comes after them when they're running as hard as they can in the other direction, Any saved person, right, as this then, any saved person has nothing to boast in except for God's grace. You don't have anything to boast in. Who are you? You are who you are by the grace of God. And that should keep us from being holier than thou. It should keep us from from vaunting ourselves over other people. It should be saying that I'm really something great. No, who I am is just, I've just been rescued. And by God's grace, by God's grace, I've missed some of these pitfalls. 
I found this path of life, and I'm begging you, don't fall in it and come this way. Faith is not something that earns God's favor, but is an abandonment of self and casting yourself on God's mercy as God enables you to do it, right? Next one, God made provision for humanity's rescue and reclamation in Christ. Okay, now this is a bold assessment in our own time. There are no other names given among men and women whereby we can be saved other than the name of Jesus. You can't, you can't read your Bible from the beginning to the end and come up with anything else, any other person who tries to argue for a wideness in God's mercy that is so wide that they can eliminate Jesus is not widening God's mercy. They're damning people. And so apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. He is the one through whom God has brought his salvation to bear. His life, his death, his resurrection destroyed death and made it possible for humans to regain the life that they had lost in their sin. I thought, I thought, saying that today as an aspiration. Follow Jesus. Right? Hung my whole life, my whole ministry, everything. I follow Jesus. He is the only Savior. There is no other salvation outside of Him. The ministry of Christ, right? Here's an important one for us today in a time of difficulty. The ministry of Christ, His character and His work leave believers no doubt as to God's love, power, and faithfulness. Right? When Christ came, He fulfilled the eternal plan of God. Is God faithful? Well, yes. Does God love us? He went all the way to the cross. Do you doubt that? Look at the cross. Is He powerful enough? He, he, he nullified death and He brought life and immortality. Look at the empty tomb with me. So today, I don't know what the darkness is. I don't know what the challenge is. But he's enough. He's enough. He's enough. Even if to follow him is the hard thing today, especially from the world's perspective, or it's over against your desire for revenge, or your, or your unwillingness to give of yourself for a person who doesn't deserve it, Christ is enough to sustain you to live towards someone who doesn't deserve it in a way that it evidences the, the love of a God who loves undeserving people. He's enough. So these are the truths, right, that Timothy has to hold on to. They give him hope. They set his expectations, right? One of the things we, it's important for us to know, God's saving work is not done yet. That's important. Thank God it's not done yet because if he's done with me, I'm disappointed, right? Especially after this morning, right? That's only a small one, Right? But I'm disappointed. If he's done with us, I'm disappointed. No, he's not done. He set us on a trajectory. There's one day when things will be right and justice will be, vent, will be uh, met out. God will reclaim and restore all things. What we yearn for will ultimately be satisfied then. So it sets our expectations. It undergirds our confidence. Today, I, I've got a God to serve. It sets my priorities, right? It sets the priorities of my prayer life for my kids. It sets the priorities of the prayer life for my husband. It sets the priorities for the prayer life for my wife, right? All those things because they need to know Jesus. They need to follow Jesus, right? Okay, so we got a sincere faith, a true path. Then he develops this idea of the enabling power, stir up the spirit, right? This is one of those ones here. And I draw together these two passages together to draw on the God-enabling, God-given enabling of the Spirit. For this reason, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Okay, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Then in verse 13, what you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, right? Well, for this supernatural task, right? The God who has brought you to himself has given you the Holy Spirit to permanently live in you, right? That's what he says here, who lives in us, right? And so he's given you the Holy Spirit, and this spirit is not a spirit of timidity. He's not a spirit that, that makes you just stand back and timidly identify with Jesus. It's a spirit of power. It's a spirit that enables you not just to, to live, but enables you to stand up and follow Jesus and trust him and say no to temptation, right? This is the spirit that moves you toward people in love, right? To, 
to desire to bring about God's best in the lives of the people around you and to do it as Jesus, to love people toward Christ as Christ. This is the spirit that, that keeps your mind from, from falling apart and going everywhere and haywire under the pressures because he puts boundaries around your life. He reminds you of the truth of God, of God's greatness, of his goodness, and says, no, things really aren't out of control. No, you haven't been abandoned. No, life is not hopeless, right? Hang in there. That's what the Spirit of God does, right? And he says, Timothy, stir up that spirit, right? And some of you are thinking, well, what do you have to do to do some spirit stirring, right? We're going to have a a seminar in spirit stirring, right, In, in the thing. Well, I think he's going to tell us all the way through But here, just let me give you a quick idea of what he's asking Timothy to do. We stir up the gift of the Spirit by inviting the Spirit's work in our life through the means of grace God has given us. Well, what is it? How are you inviting the Spirit to work in your life? Well, what's the means of you want to hear the Spirit's voice? What is that? The Word of God. Are you reading the Spirit, uh, the Word of God on a regular basis? Right? Are you reading it as if your life depends on it? As if its message is absolutely essential for your marriage today. As if its message is absolutely essential for you to be the kid that you should be at school today. To protect you from the things that you're facing. Do you read it that way? Well, to stir up the spirit, right? What is the spirit? The spirit is the ultimate author of the text who inspired the authors to do so. It's the spirit's voice on God's behalf through Christ that comes to us through the word of God. So how do we stir up the spirit's influence on our life? We invite him to speak into our life. That's one. The second one, right, is that we pray and ask for the Spirit of God to be at work in us, right? I would direct you to Paul's prayers in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. In both both of them, he says, Lord, by your Spirit, would you enable them in chapter 1 to to get a better picture of God so that they might know Him better? Chapter 3, Lord, please, by your Spirit, would you open the eyes of their hearts so that they could comprehend what it means that they're loved by Jesus. You know, if you've got somebody that you love who's walking away from Christ or somebody who's involved in something that's really crazy, you can can implore them. Uh, You can live a life before them to draw them away from it, but ultimately there's an interchange between them and the Spirit that needs to happen. God, please, by your Spirit, would you open His, hers, their eyes to see who you are, please. And Lord, as I read the scriptures, they're dull to me. I have to be honest, they're dull to me. God, would you open the eyes of my heart to see your wonders displayed before me? God, forgive me that I've gotten cold to the reality of your love for me. So we invite him by prayer. And then the third thing is that you get around spirit-filled people, right? The body of Christ, Right? You get around God's people who, what, are gifted by the Spirit and enabled by the Spirit to, what, serve each other. Right? So you get around other people who are going to encourage you in the right direction. Right? So Will, Pastor Will is famous for you know, his little statement, there, who'd you get around this week who had some wisdom? Right? Who'd you get around this week? And really all he's asking is, who'd you get around of somebody who loves the Lord, who's following Him, who's going to keep pointing you back to Jesus? Who'd you get around today? Well, the people of the Spirit. You need good friends in your life. Right? You need people that you're contacting and encouraging them in the Lord, and you need to be a person who's encouraging other people. Don't be the person who everybody has to crawl over your life to get to Jesus. Right? Be the person that's encouraging them toward Christ. And that doesn't mean you don't weep. It doesn't mean you don't have difficulties. But you're leaning into Jesus as you're weeping. You're looking for help from people as you're doing it. And you're encouraging other people that the only way to get through grief is for Jesus to be with me and me to call out to him. And would you call out with me together? Right? So the idea here is if you want to stir up the spirit, open your Bibles, get on your knees, call out to him, get around God's people and do the work that he wants us to do in the body, right? That's the only way you're going to hold fast. We need to be helping each other some days. My faith is weak and I need somebody to carry me to Jesus. Some days yours is too. Other days you're just flying high and you're just dragging a whole bunch of other people in your train, right? I'm living off of Greg today, right? Because I'm dragging. Well, that's just the way it is, right, in terms of the body of Christ. All right, now, next one, an unwavering posture, a shameless love, okay? Now, I'm I'm saying this in in terms of the world in which we live right now. It's going to be more costly to identify with Jesus, 
If things continue to go as they are, it's going to be more costly. People ask so much of the crazy things that are going on. I think the, the thing that has imp, uh, impacted me deeply is the first thing I need to pay attention to when I'm worried about what's happening on the large uh, scale of America and the world is I get all caught up in that and I forget the idea that the only thing I really know to do today is to follow Jesus today. And the first thing I need to take care of is what kind of man am I in relationship with Christ? And then what kind of man am I in relationship with my family? What kind of man am I in relationship to my colleagues? What kind of man am I with the people that I interact with in my sphere of influence? And I'm, all I can do today is follow Jesus faithfully. If he gives me some other larger platform or gives me some other idea to go about something, then again, I want to try to follow him in that. But I can't be the henny penny who's worried about the sky is falling while my house is burning down. Right? And so it's no excuse for us in the midst of the chaos to neglect our own walk with the Lord, our own care for our families, our own uh, responsibilities before God because of things that are going here. If, if they become so big that they eclipse our personal relationship with Jesus, it just simply means that our Jesus is way too small. Way too small. So the idea here is we need a shameless love. And notice what Paul, as we put it here together, he says this twice. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as a prisoner. And then Paul says, yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. Right? So the Lord holds me fast. And it's the Lord who has fulfilled God's saving promises that were planned from eternity past. He came and gave his life on the cross. He nullified death and he brought life and immortality to life. And he's going to return and there will be justice and vindication. And there will be the, because he returns as the judge of the living and of the dead and he's going to appear. And that, I'm not ashamed of him. I'm unashamed of Jesus. There may be things in my own life that I'm ashamed of. But I'm not ashamed of him. And shame on me if I can't open my mouth and identify myself as a follower of Jesus. At your school, at your work, in your home. Is it, don't you find that I'm just, this thing occurs to me, you know, sometimes when we're around our, our fellow believers... You ever, you ever have this moment where you feel the impulse to pray and then you kind of consider it for a moment and you say, well, that's kind of awkward. I don't think I'll do that. And, and that ought to immediately, just like a red flag, just go up the pole. Right? And if, you, if, you, if you're around a group of other believers and you feel for whatever, right, what goes through your head as a Christian, oh, they're going to think I'm a holier-than-thou person. Like, you know, there's Mr. Mr. Jesus guy over there. Right? No. Why is it that we as the people of God sometimes we're so awkward with one another about talking about Jesus, about praying with others, each other, about dealing with our sin with each other, right? About those kinds of things like that. Because I'm, I'm unashamedly identified with Jesus. And because I am, I know who I am. I know what I need. God, forgive me if I think I can make it on my own. God, help me not to hide my life from other people, right? And, and if you're unashamed of Jesus, right, we need to talk about Jesus. Jesus isn't a dead, past human figure. He's the ruling, reigning Lord of heaven and earth, and he's the coming judge of the living and the dead. And this is the Lord that we serve. And there may be a lot of people that I'm ashamed that I watch on TikTok. There may be a lot of of people that I'm ashamed that I'm really interested in their opinion of me or their opinions altogether. But I shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus' opinions. Right? So God help us to do that. Right? And then the idea of the right perspective. See suffering. And here is, is a, we need to be realistic as the people of God. One of the characteristics of a religious charlatan, this is always characteristic of a religious charlatan, is they want to tell you what they think you want to hear, right? And so they want to, th they want to tell you things like, you know, if you follow Jesus 
and you go to church each week and you put your money in the, in the offering plate. Did I say put your money in the offering plate? Uh, if you do all those kind of things like that, then your life is going to be great. You're not going to have any difficulties. Things are going to go swell, right? Your kids will turn out perfectly like you put them in a little Play-Doh press and they turn out like little stars, right? All those little things like that, right? That's just what happens. And all that's just not true, right? Just a moment's reflection on the life of Jesus will tell you that's not true. And so Paul, he's going to say later on, we're going to come to it and say, everyone, everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Everyone. And you know what, 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 what worries me at times for myself, right? And I'm not saying that Christians aren't people that go seek it out. We're not people that go, you know, who can I be rude to today in the name of Jesus so that they'll not like me? No, that's not any of the thing he's talking about here. He's talking about loving people toward Christ, but it's Jesus that they get upset with. It's the claims of Christ on them. And sometimes I worry about myself, I worry about my own life, that I don't present a Jesus who's Jesus enough to actually disturb them. That I come across to somebody that Jesus never threatens their lifestyle, he never challenges them to turn on their sin, he never moves them away from their own self-sufficiency or whatever else they're trusting in, but he's a Jesus that you can just add to life and he's just like a buddy and you can do those kinds of things. And it's not the Lord that comes into my life and I need him to recreate me. I need his mercy to forgive me. I need him to, to renovate me from the core all the way out. Right? And so the idea here is, is if you're going to serve Jesus and represent Jesus, you will not be liked by people. And not because you don't want to be or because you're trying to be offensive. It's just because that message offends people who think they don't need help or think they can figure out how to get help on their own or that don't want to let God tell them that they're broken and that he's the only one that can fix them, right? All those kind of things. They think they need a little bit more money. They think they need a little bit more power. They think they need a little bit more popularity. They think they just need a better job. They think they need more respect from other people. And if they had that, their life would be great. And what they don't understand is they need something so deep and so profound that will shake them to the core of who they are. And that's not what they think they need. And so the issue here is, is that as followers of Jesus, Jesus, God is busy accomplishing his saving plan. And one of the reasons why he keeps his people here over the time of this broken time is because he's a patient God who longs for people to repent. And he asks his people to put up with life in a broken world and to serve him freely and openly because he's a God who's patient and long-suffering. And you know, God knows what his mission needs. He knows what he needs to do in your life. And he knows how your life is positioned to, to affect the lives of other people. And one of our problems, I know I've mentioned this before, is we think that for God to really grow us, you know, all we need is just, you know, a, a daily bread reading a day and go to church on Sunday and I'm good. And God says, no, 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 I love you too much to let you think that that's all I need to do. I need to do something so thoroughgoing, so deep, so profound, right? If you could see the person that you're going to be, you would tempt to, you'd be tempted to worship them when I'm done. And so I'm going to take you through some difficulties because I need to strip some stuff out of your soul that you think you need. I need to put you in some difficult positions so that you can lean on me and develop this kind of spiritual fortitude, this ability to persevere in this fallen world. And then I'm going to take you on the other side of that as I heal you and bring you out of that. And I'm going to take you into the lives of other people who've suffered that so that you can bring my comfort to them. I got something profound. And so God is busy working in us at very deep levels, right? And so the idea that if we think that, right, to follow Jesus is going to keep us out of difficulties, that's not going to be true, right? Or that we think that somehow there's something wrong with me in my relationship with Christ because I'm having a hard time. Well, that's not true. That's not true, right? All right, so suffer, right? But join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And of the gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am, okay? Now, he ends this passage with two examples, right? Significant examples, okay? He ends this one in 15 to 18, and I'll just say this briefly here, right? He, he puts over against Phagellus and Hermogenes, over against Onesiphorus, 
And I just want to, this is, this is a person that's filled with the Spirit, who's holding fast to the truth of God's Word. Paul's in prison. If you're in the ancient world, it was really dangerous to go, to go visit a man in, on death row because often you'd get swept up in the dragnet, right? What kind of person is a friend of a traitor of Rome? That was dangerous to do that. It was hard to find the prisoners. They didn't put out some list. It wasn't some cushy place where the people were. They didn't, they didn't feel bound to help people know where they were. So Onesiphorus had to go to Rome. He had to search really hard until he found where they were holding Paul. And then when he found Paul, he took the extra step of saying, I love this man. I want to identify with him and I want to meet his needs. And so Onesiphorus on death row is in there taking care of Paul at the threat to his own life in a very dark place. And Paul is just just expressing his thanksgiving for a man who's willing to do that for him in this moment. And Onesiphorus is a picture of a person in the face of that who's loving, serving, on mission, right, in the face of it. And Paul not only thinks Onesiphorus, he thinks his whole household, because Onesiphorus came, it could have cost him his life, it could have cost that whole household their, their father. And he comes to love Paul in his time of desperation. All right, I'm done. Let me get this here. All right, let me say this. You can hold fast if you know that you're held fast by Christ. You can hold fast if you know that you're held fast. Right? And what we said here is to hold fast is to, is to live the unstoppable life. It begins with a sincere faith. You believe in Jesus. And I speak to my, my, my young people that are here that some of you have known you for years. I've seen you grow up. A sincere faith is not the faith of your mom and dad. A sincere faith is your faith. If your faith is the same faith that your mom and dad have, that's great. But you need to decide Jesus on your own. So I'm praying for you that you do that, right? I'm thankful for every way in which you honor your mom and dad and every which way you come to church and all those things. But apart from you believing in Jesus, you don't share in the hope that they share in and the Savior that they know. And I'll tell you right now that they yearn for you to come on your own. Right? And this is not something that I would ever encourage you to do just because it's a popular thing. It has to be your own decision. Right? It has to be your own decision, but don't drift. I don't care if you're 10. I don't care if you're 12. I don't care if you're 14. This is not something you need to put off until you're an adult. If you understand the claims of Jesus on your life, it's something that you need to reckon with today. Right? So, sincere faith, it's founded on sound doctrine, di driven by sound doctrine. It's enabled by a stirred spirit. It's expressed by a shameless love, and it expects suffering. Hold fast. Right? Sarah, would you come? And I asked Sarah, I pulled from the, the old hymnal, right? All the old people in here, which includes me. Uh, all the old people in here. This is a song that nobody has ever updated. So it is just as it is, but it's taken right from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Would you guys just, uh, Sarah, are you just going to sing or are we all singing with you? Oh, you're singing with me. Okay, let's all stand up and sing with Sarah.